preached. I'm just reading into that personally. You might use your own imagination. Keep in mind, this is following the, the crucifixion and the resurrection. And this is following Peter's three denials of the Lord. You remember that day when Simon Peter said, Lord, I'll never deny you. I'll never deny you. I'm your chief disciple. I'm the best you've got. And you can trust me. And Jesus said, no, Simon. No, you don't know what you're speaking of. You will deny me three times. And he did. And now he's had to live with that all of these days since, uh, since uh, that denial. He has not had a moment of restoration with Jesus as of yet. And I have a feeling that Simon Peter's conscience is still bothering him a little bit. He's heavy hearted because he has flashbacks of remembering his denial. He never thought it would happen. He never ever believed that he could fall into that trap of the enemy, but he did. And Simon Peter, I think, perhaps was maybe just a little bit discouraged. That's just my thought. The reason I feel like that is that he said to the other disciples, I think I'll go fishing. <laughs> Isn't that a great thing to do? The reason for that, remember, Simon Peter was a fisherman. He loved to fish. And he loved to get out there on the boat in the solitude of the quietness of the sea. He loved it. It was part of his life. And I don't know, I'm reading into this, but I think Simon Peter could say, hey, fellas, I just need to get out there and get along with, with Jesus. Maybe something good could happen to me that would encourage me. And so we see those disciples following Simon Peter out to the Sea of Tiberias. Now you follow along, John chapter 21. They fished all night long. They cast their nets to the left side of the boat all night long. When the sun came up over the eastern horizon, they pulled those nets to land to examine their catch, and they made a remarkable discovery. They had not even caught one little scrub of a fish. Any fishermen here, men or women that love to fish? I see hands going up. Would you agree that one of the most discouraging things is to go fishing and not catch anything? Cast your, cast your line into the water time after time and nothing happens? Now, if Simon Peter was a little bit discouraged before he went fishing, look at him now. And in that morning hour, as they examined their nets and found nothing, they were bewildered, a little bothered. And then the voice from the shore spoke to them and said, Children, do you have any meat? Have you caught any fish? It's very obvious. And they said, No, sir. We have not caught any fish. And the voice said to them, Take the nets from the left side of the boat and cast them to the right side of the boat. And they obeyed the voice. And as soon as those nets hit the water, you know what happened. 153 fish filled those nets. That's amazing. Amen. It was then that the beloved, probably John, I'm not sure, recognized, Hey, hey, fellas, it's Jesus the voice that has spoken to us this morning belongs to our Lord. It's the Messiah. And they, they, they became excited. And Simon Peter especially became excited. And he jumped out of the boat, girded his fish's coat around him, and helped pull the net and boat to land and ran to be in the presence of Jesus. He longed to be in the presence of his Lord. And as they came that day to the, to, to the shore, they made another remarkable discovery. Jesus had prepared breakfast. You didn't know he was a cook, did you? He had prepared breakfast for them, had it all prepared. And he said to them, hey, fellas, I know you're weary. I know you're tired. I know you're hungry. You fished all night long. Come and dine with me. Isn't that amazing? And those disciples that morning feasted at the table that Jesus had prepared. They feasted until they just could not contain any more. It was a joy and delight for them to be in the presence of their wonderful Lord. Now, there's three things I want you to write down somewhere. Elementary, easy to remember, but I want you to write them down. I want them to come alive to us this morning. Three things I think those disciples learned that morning. Three things that changed their life. Number one, I believe with all of my heart that Christ can do a better job of managing our life and taking care of us than we can ourselves. Anybody have an amen for that? 
How about some more? We found that to be true, haven't we? That Christ, because of who he is with all of his power, Christ can do a better job of taking care of us than we can ourselves. Oh, I trust we can believe that this morning. Look at these disciples. They fished that night to the left side of the boat, did not catch a fish, not one little scrub of a fish. And Jesus said to them, children, let me help you to accomplish what you could not do for yourself. Let me take charge of the situation. Take those nets from the left side and cast them to the right side. And immediately uh, what they'd been searching for all night long became a reality. Isn't that amazing? And God himself filled those nets with fish. They learned a lesson. They learned a lesson. Christ can do a better job of taking care of us than we can ourselves. They were frustrated. They were a little bothered. They did not caught any fish. They were tired. They were weary. And that morning, they listened to the voice of Jesus, and they recognized that he, the master of all, could do a much better job of taking care of them than they could themselves. Oh, folks, when are we going to learn that? When are we going to learn that? You notice I use the plural pronoun we. <laughs> so I, I, I can't preach to you without preaching to myself. When are we going to learn that? That our God is still in control. And he has all good things for his children. And he can take care of us beyond our fondest dreams. He can answer prayer that unbelievable for us. Because he's Jesus and he knows what's best for us. Uh, and he wants to do for us what we can't do for ourselves. When are we going to learn that the answer to spiritual victory is to take our hands off and let him have it? Wow. Huh? That's a lesson to be learned. But when we do take our hands off and commit it to the Lordship of Jesus, we soon realize that he is sufficient for every need of our life. And he has everything that we need and everything that's required for us to live spiritually for him. I say glory to God. The disciples learned that. The second simple truth that they learned that morning is this. If you're going to be victorious, you may have to change your ways of doing things. Oh, now, Pastor George, we were with you until now. Mm. You're meddling now. You sure that's in your notes? I don't even have any notes. So, you know, I don't know if it's in there. Well, Pastor George, we don't like change. Mm. We're slow to change. We've had enough changes in life. Huh? It's hard to live with. It's hard to dream. It's hard to realize the changes that we've had to face down through the years of time and all the things that are still changing so rapidly, it's hard to keep up. It's unbelievable. And what works today won't work tomorrow, so we have to change and learn all over again. It's that way of life. But those disciples learned a lesson. Notice. According to the scriptures, they fished to the left side of the boat. Am I right? That's scripture. Jesus said to them that morning, take the nets and cast them to the right side of the boat. Let's do something different this morning. Now, I'm well aware, I don't know it to be a fact, but one of those disciples had to be a Nazarene. We ain't never done it like this before. Well, you might as well smile at me. You've got to love me. We ain't never done it like this before. It ain't going to work. <laughs> now, I don't know. I don't know that that happened. But it makes good conversation, doesn't it? Jesus said, take the nets. Let's do it differently today. Move them from the left side. Put them over on the right side for a change. And when they obeyed the Lord... Immediately, those nets were filled with fish. Now, I don't know about your life, but I've had to learn some valuable lessons in change. I'm, I, I'm slow to change, although we have to change. 
there are some changes that's for good, and we have to keep up. But when it comes to our spiritual life, we learn a valuable lesson that maybe the things that have not worked in the past to bring us to spiritual victory may need some changes made. Huh? If we're still struggling with spiritual issues, if we're still struggling and praying about the same spiritual problems that we prayed about last year or the year before, then perhaps it's time that we make some changes in the way we live. If you're not happy with your prayer life, change it. <laughs> if you're not happy with your Bible study, by all means, change it. If you're not faithful to the church, by all means, change it. But there's some things that need to be changed for us to walk with God by faith. The truth of the matter is, if we keep doing the same old things that we've been doing, we're going to get the same old results that we've always gotten. Now, that's true with us personally. That's true with us as a church. We're in a transition period in our church, and uh, there's going to be some changes made. Every time you bring on a spiritual leader, another leader, there are some definite changes that are made, new visions, new goals, new ideas. And so as a congregation, we have to change with them and to get on board to see what God has for us. But they learned a lesson. If you're going to be victorious, allow some changes to be made in your life. It's that simple. It's that simple. The third simple truth is this, that they learn. What you seek for and what you long for and what you pray for is a lot closer than what you think it is. How many of you believe that? Why are we so amazed, folks, when God answers prayer? Huh? Have you ever stopped to think about that? It reminds me when the crowd was praying for Peter in prison. <laughs> Remember that story? Oh, they were on their knees praying and fasting for Peter to be released, and all of a sudden there was a knock on the door. The little damsel went to the door and closed the door and came back. Who was it? Peter. No way. Well, we're praying for Peter. He's in prison. No way it could be him, but it was. God had released him. What you seek for this morning, what you're praying for, what you're longing for is a lot closer than what you think it is. Amen. Some of you are one step away from some of the, the most spiritual blessings you've ever received in a lifetime. Some of you are one step away from some of the greatest miracles that you've ever had accomplished in your life. Some of you are on the verge of just breaking through to a real spiritual dynamic walk with God. Just that one more step of faith. One more step of faith. And those disciples learned a lesson that morning. What they'd been seeking for, they'd fished all night to the left side of the boat and Jesus said, take the nets, cast them to the right side. And they did just a small craft. It wasn't a big ship. And just a few feet away from where they fished all night long was a net full of fish. It was amazing. Oh, Brother George, that was, that was God. Sure it was. It's amazing what God wants to do in our lives. It's amazing what he's just waiting to accomplish in your life this morning and my life as we wait patiently before him. But they learned a lesson. What they sought for is a lot closer than what it, what it actually was. Now, Tammy read the scripture that brings us to our text of the morning. They came to land, had a remarkable fellowship with Jesus, feasted there at the breakfast table until their, their, their bodies were content. It was a wonderful experience to be in the presence of Jesus again. It always is. We've experienced his presence here this morning. Amen. Wonderful to be in his presence. When they had finished their meal, Jesus dropped a spiritual bomb into the life of Simon Peter. I don't think that Jesus took Simon out behind the house to address the issue. I think publicly it had to be addressed because Peter had denied the Lord three times publicly. 
His disciples knew that. His fellow disciples knew that Peter was a failure there at the fire that night. And Jesus took the opportunity to look at Simon Peter tenderly and say, Simon, Peter, do you love me? Every time I read that scripture, it gets to my heart. Simon, do you love me? What a question. What a question. Do you love me? Simon Peter replied, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Second time, Jesus said, Simon, do you really love me? Wow. Huh? And the second time, Peter responded, Lord, I really love you. It's amazing, isn't it? A love relationship. Have you men ever had your wife to look at you and say, honey, do you love me? Huh? Has that ever happened to you? Thank you. Thank you. Or have you ever reached out and said to them, honey, I love you and really meant it? Huh? You're mighty quiet on me. You do know what I'm talking about, don't you? Huh? Not all Greek, is it? <laughs> it makes for a, a perfect relationship, a good relationship, to wrap your arms around somebody that you really love and say, you know that I love you. No questions. You know that I love you. And every once in a while, that mate of ours needs to hear it. Now, I'm not boasting. Yes, I am too. I'm going to have boasting rights this morning. Every night before we retire for the evening. Honey, what did I tell you? I love you. And in that tender, sweet, angelic voice, she responds back, honey, I love you. Now I can lay my head down, close my eyes, and go to sleep. I've already told the Lord I love him. Lord, dear Lord, I love you. Now it's all settled. Praise the Lord. Something about love. Simon Peter responded, Lord, you know I really love you. And then Jesus said, Simon, wait a minute. We're not through yet. I have one more question. Do you really love me more than all of this? Wow. Have you ever stopped to analyze that? Huh? I don't think that Jesus was referring to the other disciples' love. No, no way. But I want you to catch a picture. I've got it in my mind. I filled in the blanks. I don't think it's taken away from the scriptures. We agree on something. Simon Peter was a fisherman, right? Wave at me, right? We know that. That's scriptural. He was mending his nets when Jesus found him and called him out to be a fisher of men. Amen. Simon Peter loved to fish. Wave at me again. You believe that? Sure he did. It was, it was his life and his lifestyle. He lived for it before he met Jesus. It was primary in his life. It was the most important thing to him to fish, catch fish. It was his lifestyle. He loved it. He loved it. Now, here in the early morning hours, there at the Sea of Tiberias, the scene had been cast. Simon Peter, the fisherman, who loved to catch fish, now was responsible for catching the greatest catch that he'd ever caught in his life. Does that make sense to you? He'd never had a catch like this. And the nets were not broken. It's amazing. Oh, he loved it. He loved it. It was it was, it was an enjoyment that he looked forward to, and now he delighted in the fact that the nest was full of fish. Now, I can only speculate again, for I find we do this a lot of times. I can see him gazing into the precious holy face of Jesus. Oh, what a delight, what a privilege. And Jesus was giving him that look of compassion. 
You know the reason for three questions, naturally. There were three denials. And now he had to be made completely whole. And I see Simon Peter, I don't know if you can relate to this or not. Maybe it speaks to us a lot of times. But we have so many issues in our life. Simon, gazing into the eyes of Jesus, he was so sincere, so sincere. But every once in a while, he'd look over his shoulder. He'd look back into the face of Jesus. And then we see him looking over his shoulders. I mean, he loved the fish. And there was those wiggly fish in that net. Oh, you got it? You got it? But finally his eyes come to rest entirely upon Jesus. And with a brokenness and sincerity, he said, Lord, you know all things. And you know that I really do love you. Oh, oh, my goodness. With all the glamour and hustle and bustle and business of our world, and we were involved in so many things that it's, we can't even keep up. worry about things that never happen. Now, you're not like that. But so many things that catch our attention, bad news and good news, it just captivates our attention all the time. Our mind is constantly, consistently on something. Am I right? Even legitimate things in our life, nothing wrong with fishing. Nothing wrong with catching fish. When I was pastor, a good friend of mine, he was a fisherman. Oh, he loved to fish. Had a nice boat, and he always was inviting his pastor to go fishing with him. So Henry and I went fishing. We'd go out there constantly. This one occasion, we went out, and we fished. We fished all day long. He didn't catch a thing. It's amazing. And I caught the biggest fish of the day. Yeah. Oh, I was so proud. It was just about like that. <laughs> he took a picture of it. He still reminds me of it. Here's the fish you caught. You tell everybody you really caught all the fish, and I did. What, no story? But here it is, Pastor, right? To, about that size. <laughs> I've never had a whole lot of success in fishing. <laughs> Another one of my members, Jeff, we'd love to fish. We'd kayak down the James River together. And uh, his boy, Eric, is, oh, he's quite a fisherman, quite a young man. Oh, bless his heart. Loves Jesus. And we'd be kayaking down the river, and I'd cast him. Jeff would say, Pastor, there's a big old bass right over there. How do you know? Just trust me, big old bass right over there. I'd throw my line over there, hit right where he said, nothing. Absolutely Nothing. Jeff said, Pastor, I tell you, there's a bass right over there. No, Jeff, there's no bass over there. Okay, I'm going to prove it. So he takes his line, throws it identically in the same place where I'd cast my line, and guess what? Here came the biggest bass you could ever think of. Why couldn't I do that? Nothing wrong with fishing. Nothing wrong with a lot of things in our life. Some things we have to do, some things we don't. We get involved in so much in life, so much. We just go, 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 go all the time trying to keep up. Huh? But there comes a time when we have to face the issue and the question of Jesus when he says to us, hey, son, daughter, do you love me more than all of this? And I thought about that this week in my quiet time. I could hear the voice of my Lord saying, George, George, am I first in your life? Do you love me more than even your family that I've given you? Do you love me more than the beautiful home that I've let you have? 
when I found myself, folks, time after time this week, having to confess to my Jesus, say, you know all things, Father, and you know that I love you. Is that where we are on this Sunday morning? Nothing held back from Jesus. No dark corners of our life. Our hands off of everything, letting God have it. Knowing that Christ can do a better job of taking care of us than we can. He can, you know. He can. And if there's going to be some changes made, spiritual changes, there may be some things we have to do differently. And what you seek for right now in this service, what you're praying desperately for, what you're crying out for, and the Lord knows what it is, is a lot closer than what you think it is. And their spiritual victory in Jesus. I say praise the Lord. Would you stand with me please? God bless your heart. Praise the Lord. God bless you. Just bow your heads with me for a moment. Just bow your heads with me for a moment. Can you hear? Can you hear? Can you hear our amazing Lord? The Lord of hosts, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Can you hear him this morning as he analyzes everything that's going on in our life? And he knows it all. You don't have to sit down and describe it to him. There's no surprises with God. He knows who we are. He knows where we are. He knows what we're struggling with. He knows what we're praying for. And if we listen closely, we can hear Jesus saying, Son, daughter, do you love me more than all of this? Do you really love me more than all of this? Heavenly Father, bless you and go to our heart. Sincerely, that's the way we want to live. Sometimes we're infected with other desires. We find ourselves looking over our shoulders at the things of life. But, oh God, give us a desire after the heart. Don't, oh God, please allow the enemy or allow the world to put things into our life that would separate us or keep us from victory. Oh God, it could be that there's someone here this morning that would say, I just need to move up to the heart of God. I feasted at his table many times, but now I just need to look at him face to face and answer the call. Lord, you know all things, and you know that I love you. I don't want to miss loving Jesus or having Jesus love someone more than us. But right now in the closing moments of this service, we come face to face with you, Lord like Simon Peter did that morning. We hear your voice. We yield to it. Heads bowed, eyes closed. You'd like to say, Pastor George, the word spoken to me today. I really do need to pray about some issues in my life. I don't want to get so involved not Lord. I don't want to get my attention on so many things that I don't have time to worship you. So here's what I'm going to do. Some of you would like to come to pray and have people just pray with you on just one hand, not right, but just one hand. Some of you might like to come privately. You don't want anybody to bother you. You don't want
and anybody can say a word to you. I want you to come over here and come there. And you're all by yourself in the presence of the Lord. But he's here this morning. The Holy Spirit is here in this service. Don't leave. Don't leave. Don't leave without Jesus. left if you just like to come and touch God. Over here on my right if you'd like to come, maybe have somebody here with you. Sing with them if you can. Sing with them. Just come. Come on. You won't be by yourself now. You won't be by yourself. All to Jesus I surrender By yourself now, there's those that have led the way. Come on, let's enjoy him the in presence of Jesus. Let's presence enjoy victory in him Would you do that? Come on. I Casting everything on him. Taking our hands off. Since your presence, we feel your touch. Bless these that have come to this altar this morning. You know their heart's desire. And I pray that you would reach down and wrap your arms around them and just give them a heavenly tug of love. We also believe there are some altars that are being built right out there in the chairs, right in the people settings there. They're building some altars. And they're touching the heart of God with their own prayers. And I pray that you would descend upon this place. And before we leave here, that we realize Jesus has touched us. And we'll never be the same again. Praise be to God. Thank you for the restoration of Peter and there at the Sea of Tiberias. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for victory in this service. Praise your holy name. Amen. May we stop looking over our shoulders and gaze in your presence. The Lord of Lords, Lord Supreme. We praise you today. God bless